Tim O'Brien was born in a small town in Minnesota, Austin, Minnesota, attended McAllister College with a degree in political science, was drafted in 1969, was assigned to the division that two years earlier had been involved in the My Lai Massacre, uh, and reluctantly served for two years in Vietnam. After returning to the States, he studied government at Harvard, covered the White House and other beats for the Washington Post, and then began writing his own autobiographical fictional works. He currently teaches creative writing at Texas State University in Austin, Texas, and is working on a book blending fiction and autobiography, as so many of his works do, dealing with a father in the 60s with two very young sons. There is no question that Tim O'Brien is one of the most accomplished and admired writers of our era. He has written one memoir at seven full-length works of fiction. He won the Pulitzer Prize for going after Cacciato, was, was nominated, I mean, I'm sorry, the National Book Award, was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize uh, and the National Book Critics Circle Award for the things they carry, has been given grants and awards by the uh, Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and other organizations. He is a literary star. We already know that one reason all of us are here. But beyond his well-deserved stature among critics, the main reason we are all here, I suspect, certainly the reason I feel privileged to introduce him, is that he is a writer who engages readers. Not always the same thing as winning over the critics. Very nice when somebody can do both, as he has. He moves us, provokes us, gets us to listen to, to pay attention to, difficult stories that need to be told, that he needs to tell, and that we find very moving once we are willing to listen to them. And the things that Harry Tim O'Brien did not want to tell the kind of politicized war story that, for instance, dominated the films that first came out of America's engagement in Vietnam. Films such as The Green Berets on the Hawk End of the Spectrum in 1968, or The Deer Hunter and Coming Home in 1969 on the Dove End. For many years, we, these were the only kinds of stories for the war, against the war, that we as a culture were willing to hear. And as a culture, we often treated Vietnam veterans accordingly, either as heroes or killers. What we were not willing to hear were stories of the soldiers themselves, of quote, how it felt to be there, as the narrator, Tim O'Brien, fictionalized more or less, of the things they carry tell them. That's one of the central quotations of the book. He wants us to feel how it felt to be there. And he does. He tells us, he gets us to feel how it was for the fictional Tim O'Brien to stand, to be in a boat 20 yards from the Canadian shore, wondering whether he should go there to avoid a war he didn't believe in, uh, or to go to war and lose contact with his family perhaps forever, or to go to a war that he did not believe in and possibly get killed and be forced to kill. He tells us stories of comrades who feel personally responsible when one of their comrades is killed, even though they may or may not literally be responsible for such a thing. He tells stories of love and loyalty and tension, of the terror of war and the exhilaration of war and the boredom of war, of occasional ordinary acts of courage but not acts of extraordinary heroism, of the failure to act at crucial moments more often than action itself, and of the difficulties of moving on after the war. You can tell a true war story, his narrator tells us, if it embarrasses you. And again and again inside the novel, Tim O'Brien makes it clear that even among the soldiers, these stories were not easy to tell and not easy to hear. But outside the novel, he succeeded spectacularly, I would say, in inducing readers to listen willingly, attentively. Vietnam veterans who love this book readers like myself of his own generation, but who are not in Vietnam, and other readers as well. As someone who has been teaching contemporary fiction at IU for over 30 years, I can say honestly that no book has so consistently resonated with my students. I've taught it virtually every year since it came out in 1990. He owes me a couple of years. <laughs> as, as the things they carry, the subject of his talk. It is the way he tells these stories that gets us to listen. And since that is one of the main subjects of this talk, I'll stop here. We are obviously ready to listen, and he is ready to talk to us. Please join me in welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm really, can you hear me okay? I've got a mic, is the microphone working? Really a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm flattered by the invitation to deliver the Brannigan lecture, but I'm also uh, terrified by the word lecture. Uh, I'm not sure I'm capable of doing a lecture lecture. This will be more a talk lecture or a conversation lecture than a lecture lecture. Um, I am not a public speaker by trade. You can already, I'm sure you've already figured that out. I spend my days and many of my nights sitting in my underwear in front of a computer <laughs> telling stories and uh, lost in a private world of my characters, my own history, some imagines, some from memory. And when I get into situations such as this one, uh, my instinct is to, is to turn and run, which I'm not going to do. I'm going to fight it, and I think I'm going to succeed. I am not, I'm not uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey or Chris Matthews or Bill O'Reilly or even Tony Danza. I'm, <laughs> I'm just a writer. And uh, as a writer of, of fiction, what I think I do best is to tell stories. And so in considering how to deliver this talk to you tonight, I thought the way to do it really would be to do it through story. And then to talk about the stories in a non-fiction sort of way, their origins, why they were written, why I'm telling them tonight, uh, what I hope to communicate. The effort is in doing a story is not to convey a moral or a message or a wise bit of uh, counsel to you. What's the message of Thumbelina? There, eat your carbohydrates and grow up and get big. Or of Hansel and Gretel, or of, or of the sun also rises. Uh, literature does not aspire to giving you advice on how to live your life. That's not the function of literature not the function of art in general. In a way, one doesn't even have to defend story. It just is the way we would try to defend breathing while you're breathing. It'd be kind of hard to do to like, stop breathing to defend breathing. And it's the same with story. I don't think it needs a defense. And yet, story has been for a long while under assault. It's thought of, in our, at least in our culture, and I think in others as well, is somehow less than uh, 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 the sciences, the uh, empirical uh, sciences. And in fact, not long ago, I think maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago, a debate erupted in the New York Times over this very issue. Uh, a well-known scientist, whose name I won't utter here, uh, said, the arts are just fun. And that's it. And the only way human knowledge is really advanced with the emphasis on the word knowledge is advanced is through, through, the, through the sciences. And of course, a great furor erupted over this, which I was a modest part, not in any public sense, just muttering to myself in my living room about the debate, <laughs> taking part in it the way I used to take part in the debate over Vietnam itself, muttering to myself. So I'm going to begin with a story. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about why I'm uh, telling the story to you. This one I'm just going to tell you. Uh, and a couple of people in this audience have heard it before, a different version slightly, for which I apologize. But I only have one life, and I can't, it's, that's where my stories come from. Uh, you're looking at a 65-year-old guy now. It's hard for me to believe. I feel like I'm a little kid. But I am 65. I turned 65 a couple of uh, weeks ago. And I'm the father of a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, my first and only kids. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I caught the younger kid who's six. I caught him in, uh, his name is Tad. I caught him in the bathroom uh, peeing into a wastebasket. <laughs> and not just a wastebasket, but a wire mesh wastebasket. <laughs> <laughs> and not just a wire mesh wastebasket, but a wire mesh wastebasket situated atop a, a brand new maroon rug carpet that I just laid. My wife said, don't do it, don't do it. And, you know, it's going to get right. She was right. <laughs> anyway, there's Tad peeing into this wastebasket. I said, why are you doing this? I mean, he's six. He knows better. And over and over again, I said, why? Well, I, my, my voice was, to say the least, pretty earnest. 
to the point that I, I scared the kid, and he tried to turn to the toilet, but <laughs> got halfway there, and was kind of paralyzed, sort of in between the two. And the whole while, I'm, I'm not yelling, but uh, I'm speaking loudly enough for him to hear me. Why are you doing this? My wife rushed in. She, she just heard the anger in my voice, and uh, she shooed me away back to my office. Well, about, I don't know, about an hour or an hour and a half later, Tad toddled into my office, and he said, Daddy, Daddy. And I said, what? And he said, I've got two heads. And I said, what? And he said, I've got two heads. And I said, what? He said, you asked why I did it, and it's because I've got two heads. He said, one head was saying to me, Daddy's not going to like this. <laughs> and the other head was saying, this is going to be fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> instantaneously, a whole bunch of things came rushing at me all at once, the first of which was a immense pride in my own kid, who suddenly seemed more perceptive about the human animal than a good many commentators you're going to see on CNN or the Fox Channel or whatever other station you tune into, the complexities of, all of, the, of the human being. He knew more than a lot of other people who are much older than uh, little Tad are ever going to learn in their lives. The second thing that struck me was he was not the, the budding juvenile delinquent I had been imagining you know, an hour and a half before as he's peeing into the wastebasket. I had pictured my kid you know, locked up somewhere in a you know, juvie hall. <laughs> the, uh, the, la the last thing that struck me was, and the important one, was that I want to tell this kid a story, and his older brother too. And so that night at bedtime, I, I have this tradition in our house, I'm a writer, so why just read books, but I want to tell my own stories. And I began a story to the kids this way. I said, once upon a time, I actually knew somebody with two heads. And uh, Tad said, really, what was his name? And I said his name was Daddy. And uh, both Tad and Timmy kind of turned and looked at my neck, like where the stump was of the, <laughs> of the extra head. And uh, Timmy said, you really had two heads? And they said, yes, maybe more than two. And then for maybe the next half an hour, 20 minutes, I told my sons of the story of what had happened to me in the summer of 1968, the summer I was drafted, uh, the summer I became a soldier. In a sense, I think what I was doing was lying in the dark that night with those two little boys uh, you know, flanking me was to try to give them a little bit at their age uh, a sense of their father's history, this old coot, you know, lying in bed with them, who 20 years from now probably won't be around at all, or if he will be around, will be pretty enfeebled. I mean, basketball is going to be a problem when you're 85, <laughs> let's fa face it. And a little sense of their father. Uh, but I was telling a kind of Ajaxed, sanitized version of the Rainy River chapter and the things they carried about the young man who finds himself drafted, opposed to the war, and yet loves his country, uh, is from a conservative small town in southern Minnesota, uh, a believer pretty much in all the conservative values uh, in the old sense of conservative, you know, saving things and taking care of the land and the air and the water, that used to be conservative. In the old days, you were conserving stuff. And I believed in my country, and I loved my country. My dad had been a soldier, or sailor, rather, in World War II. My mom had been a wave. And yet there I was trapped in the summer of uh, 1968, wearing these two heads, one wanting to serve my country, and the other head not believing in, in uh, that war going on over in, v in Vietnam. And the question was, what do you do? Well, one of those heads located, let's say, over my right shoulder uh, was, I say, fiercely patriotic and uh, respected authority and believed in such values as duty and sacrifice and service to one's country. But the other head, situated over here, also believed in those things, but still could, the 
best that head think could find to say about Vietnam, the war in Vietnam, or was that certain blood was being shed for uncertain reasons, which is to say the blood was for sure, the dead people were dead, and nobody disputed it. The maimed were maimed, the orphans were orphans, the widows were widows, there was no arguing about it, it was certain. But the reasons for the war were at best uncertain, and anyone who lived through that era knows what I'm talking about when hawks were at the throats of doves and Rhodes scholars couldn't make their minds up about the rectitude of the war. Fulbright over here, Rusk over here. Both of them, you know, smart, smart guys with utterly uh, uh, contradictory uh, positions on, on the war in Vietnam. Well, I was 21 years old when I received that draft notice, and I was terrified. And through the summer of 1968, those two heads endlessly confronted each other, challenging, mocking, cussing at each other, invoking the names of God and LBJ and Richard Nixon and Abby Hoffman and Jane Fonda and Daffy Duck. <laughs> at times, those two heads spoke quietly and almost rationally, not quite, but almost. And at other times, those two heads screamed the most outlandish obscenities at each other, much as people were screaming in the streets all across America, screaming their black and white platitudes across our republic in the hot summer of 1968. Well, by this point, of course, Timmy and Tad were sound asleep. <laughs> it was way beyond them. They were dreaming their youthful dreams. But for a long, long time that night, I lay there in the dark, not speaking aloud anymore, but telling the story to myself, as I've been telling it now for four decades, a story not so much of bombs and bullets and all the Vietnam stuff you'd expect a story to be about, but a story that was a pre-war story. Should I go to it or not? What's the right thing to do when you're 21 years old and you're living with imperfect knowledge and don't even know yourself very well, much less a civilization, you know, uh, halfway around the world, politics that were foreign to me. Now and then, as I lay there that night, one head would score a kind of sterile rhetorical victory, and other times the other head would win the day. Sometimes one head might say, what a coward you were for going to that war. And the other head will shake its head and say, you did what your country asked you to do. And the first head will chuckle and say, all right, and what if my country told me to blow up Toronto tomorrow? Do we just do it? Is that what patriotism is? We're sheep, we're automatic, we're robots. And the other head will sternly say, you live in a great and a good country, a country that would never issue such an order. And the other head will say, ah, but what about me lie? What about the American Indian? What about weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist? And the other head will say, everybody makes mistakes. And the other head will say, exactly my point. Everybody makes mistakes. And on and on and on for 40 years. Well, it strikes me now, uh, on this day in October of 2011, that a good many of you in this audience may soon find yourselves engaging in many such uh, ceaseless uh, internal debates. It doesn't have to be about war. Should I marry Bill or should I marry Phil? <laughs> or should I dump them both and marry Jill? <laughs> Should I keep plugging away at this hateful job, one I've despised since the day I took it, and take off for Fiji, or should I not? Should I go to grad school, or should I husk corn in Nebraska? Part of being an adult 
part of being human for that matter, as opposed to being, say, a chipmunk or a gopher, is that at certain points in one's life, you will carry upon your shoulders a couple of heads, and probably at many times uh, multiple heads, way beyond two. It can be a curse at late night lying there in the dark talking to myself for 40 years, uh, that endless speculation about what I could have done or maybe should have done. And you may well find yourselves, I'm speaking now to the students here, uh, in a decade still to come, lying in bed with your own children, revisiting through a story, a moral choice you had made or, or failed to make or would now make differently. Two heads can be the sign of an open mind, a mind attuned to the world's pesky ambiguities and unknowns and mysteries and uncertainties. A sign of a person sophisticated enough to understand that knowledge can be imperfect and that one's own judgments set in a particular time and place may also be imperfect or even dead wrong or may evolve and refine themselves. To carry two heads through life, however burdensome, however heavy, however often they'll keep you awake until four in the morning, however dispiriting, may nonetheless help to avoid the soul-killing, people-killing danger of absolutism. Mohammed Atta, the hijacker and pilot of one of those airliners that struck the World Trade Center, had but one head, a bonehead at that, an absolutist of the most consummate and deadly sort. Mohammed Atta thought he knew the final and definitive truth of things, a truth worth killing for and dying for. Let us not. Let you not and me not commit the same one-headed sin of vanity and complacency and self-righteousness and self-congratulation and zealotry and fanaticism and demagoguery and simple-minded black and white, I'm right and you're wrong declarations about the truth of our world. I consider that sinful. After the events of recent years, I have come to fear that our own country, as much as any country, maybe not more, but as much, is endangered by such slick, self-centered, self-righteous, pious, holier-than-thou, black-and-white, absolutist rhetoric that erases our shortcomings and pooh-poohs our ethical and moral failures. Torture, for example. One important role of literature, if nothing else, is to remind us of the complications and the contradictions and the ambiguities of the world we all live in, this puzzling universe we inhabit. It is important, of course, to have the courage of one's convictions. But what if one has the conviction that women belong in the kitchen and in the bedroom and nowhere else? Do we applaud that courage of conviction? Or do we find fault with the old saw, the commonsensical saying, courage of conviction? Muhammad Atta had his convictions and he flew an airplane into the World Trade Center. Hitler had his. So watch out, too, for such platitudes as the phrase courage of conviction. For conviction itself can be transformed and has been transformed into the most barbarous and murderous horror. Your two heads will be heavy, I know from experience, but carry them high and don't forget to use them. If there is a central point to the things they carried, <laughs> there is not. <laughs> but if there were, 
<laughs> it would be to understand that one man's truth might be another man's lie, that one man's terrorist might be another man's freedom fighter, and that the word truth, with its built-in absolutism, can sometimes get us in deep, deep trouble. So-called truths can evolve and be turned utterly upside down. I'm not speaking just about global issues now, war and peace. I'm talking about the lives we all lead. Uh, how well do we know ourselves? How well do we know our wives and our children and our brothers? We guess, we estimate. But we're all of us as human beings encased in these leaden skulls of ours. I'm in mine and you're in yours. You don't have access to my thoughts. I don't have access to yours. And to say you know someone is to set yourself up for the most horrid surprises now and then. When she walks out the door at five in the morning and never comes back. Or your son decides, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, Harvard. I'm, I'm going to uh, Iraq. Uh, we do suffer surprises, even about our, the, those closest to us. So-called truths can be contradictory. I could talk for an hour and a half tonight about our great and good country, our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, and I'd be telling the truth. Or I could say America is a country that once permitted slavery, and I'd also be telling the truth. They're contradictory, but you have a mature mind somehow can manage to hold contradictory truths, in quotes, uh, simultaneously. Truths can be relative. Yeah, I can say now it's you know, 8 o'clock. I'm not going to look at my watch. I'll guess. And it may be true here in Indiana, but it's not true in Texas, where I live, and it's not true on Neptune, is it? So truth has a temporal component. What I'm addressing now through a back door, in a way, is one of the central problems of the things they carried, which is as undergraduate express it, why the hell did you do that to my mind? Why did you play with truth? Why did you blur the real world and a fictional world? Why didn't you just tell me what happened? Why didn't you just tell me the truth? The truth being that kind of in that common sense uh, phrase. And the answer is, I don't know the truth. So I, I tried to do the best I could by approximating it. I was brought up a Methodist in uh, southern Minnesota. And uh, as clearly as I can see you right now, I can see my minister, his name was Reverend Ireland, giving a sermon, the title of which was, Thou Shalt Not Kill. And it was, uh, he was pretty blunt about it. He said, there are no qualifiers in the Bible. There are no conditions. It's just, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say, unless your country tells you to, or unless your son is threatened by a murder. It just says, thou shalt not. And then, I don't know, but three years later, I found myself in boot camp and basic training in Fort Lewis, Washington, where I was told, you'd better kill, or we'll court-martial your ass. You'd bet. Well, who's right? What's the truth? How am I supposed to tell you? But after 40 years, I still don't know the answer to that question. I still bother it night after night in my sleep. To give you an example of the overwhelming ambiguity of what the war in Vietnam and its aftermath has felt like for me, this uncertainty, which is at the heart of what I'm talking about tonight, I want to try an experiment of reading very briefly for you a. Uh, this is a story aspect of what I mentioned earlier from the things I carried, a very short little section. Um, and then I want to talk about why it was written as it was written, this whole truth uh, issue I just brought up, and what I tried to accomplish with the piece, or what I hope to accomplish and probably failed doing, but nonetheless made a stab at. When she was nine, my daughter Kathleen, you know I'm lying already, don't you? Because I don't, I don't have any daughter named Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's made up. Uh, I, need, I, needed a, I, needed a, I needed a kid. I didn't have any kids at all in this. I needed a child in this book to ask the main character, who bears my name, the question adults just don't ask. You, they, did you ever kill anyone? 
Adults find any way they can to avoid asking that question. They don't want to embarrass themselves or me, so they avoid it. But kids, so anyway, when she was not nine, my daughter Kathleen asked if I'd ever killed anyone. She knew about the war. She knew I'd been a soldier. You keep writing these war stories, she said, so I guess you must have killed somebody. It was a hard moment, but I did what I thought was right, which was to take her on my lap and just hold her for a while. Someday, I hope, she'll ask again. But here, right now, I want to pretend she's a grown-up. I want to tell her exactly what happened, or what I remember happening. And then I want to say to her that as a little girl, she was absolutely right. This is why I keep telling war stories. He was a short, slender young man of about 20. I was afraid of him, afraid of something. And as he passed me on the trail, I threw a grenade that landed at his feet and killed him. Or to go back. Shortly after midnight, we moved into the ambush site outside a little village called Mikay. The whole platoon was there, maybe 40 of us, spread out in the dense brush along the trail. And for five hours, nothing at all happened. We were working in two-man teams, one man on guard while the other slept, switching off every two hours. And I remember it was still dark when my friend Kiowa shook me awake for the final watch. The night was foggy and hot. For the first few moments, I felt lost, not sure about directions, groping for my helmet and my weapon. I reached out and found three grenades and lined them up in front of me. The pins had already been straightened for quick throwing. And then, for maybe half an hour, I just kneeled there in the dark and waited. Very gradually, in tiny slivers, dawn began to break through the morning fog. And from my position in the brush, I could see 10 or 15 meters up the trail. The mosquitoes were fierce. I remember slapping at them, wondering if I should wake up Kiowa and ask for some repellent, then thinking that was a bad idea, and then looking up and seeing the young man come out of the morning fog. He wore black clothing and rubber sandals and a gray ammunition belt. The shoulders were slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side as if listening for something. He seemed at ease. He carried his weapon in one hand, muzzled down, moving without any hurry up the center of the trail. There was no sound at all, none that I can remember. And in a way, it seemed that he was part of the morning fog, or part of my own imagination. But there was also the reality of what was happening in my stomach. I had already pulled the pin on a grenade. I had come up to a crouch. It was entirely automatic. I did not hate the young man. I did not see him as the enemy. I did not ponder issues of morality or politics or military duty. I just crouched and kept my head down. I tried to swallow whatever was rising from my stomach, which tasted like lemonade, something fruity and sour. I was terrified. There were no thoughts about killing. The grenade was to make him go away. just evaporate. And I leaned back and felt my head go empty, and then felt it fill up again. I had already thrown the grenade before telling myself to throw it. It was gone. The brush was thick, and I had to lob it high, not aiming. And I remember that grenade seeming to freeze above me 
for just an instant, as if a camera had clicked. And I remember ducking down and holding my breath and seeing little wisps of fog rise from the earth. The grenade bounced once and rolled across the trail. I did not hear it, but there must have been a sound because the young man dropped his weapon and began to run. Just two or three quick steps. Then he stopped, turned to his right, looked down at the grenade, he tried to cover his head, but never did. It occurred to me then that he was about to die. I wanted to warn him. The grenade made a popping noise, not soft, but not loud either, not what you'd expect. And there was a puff of dust and smoke, a small white puff. And the young man seemed to jerk upward as if pulled by invisible wires. He fell on his back. His rubber sandals had been blown off. He lay at the center of the trail, his right leg bent beneath him, his one eye shut, his other eye a huge star-shaped hole. For me, it was not a matter of live or die. I was in no real danger. Almost certainly the young man would have passed me by. And it will always be that way. Later I remember Kiowa tried to tell me that the man would have died anyway. He told me it was a good kill. He told me I was a soldier. This was a war that I should shape up and stop staring. and ask myself what the dead man would have done if things were reversed. But you see, none of that mattered. All those words, they were way too complicated. All I could do was gape at the fact of the young man's body. Even now, I haven't finished sorting it out. Sometimes I forgive myself, other times I don't. In the ordinary hours of life, I try not to dwell on it. But now and then, when I'm reading a newspaper, or just sitting alone in a room, I'll look up and I'll see the young man step out of the morning fog. I'll watch him walk toward me, his shoulders slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side, and he'll pass within a few yards of me and suddenly smile at some secret thought and then continue up the trail to where it bends back into the morning fog. Why do I pick that story of all the possibilities and the things they carry to kind of conclude tonight? Partly to address the whole issue of truth. The story is invented. It's made up. It didn't, didn't happen, at least not that way. As you know already, there is no Kathleen, no daughter. I needed the child for the reason I, reasons I told you. Beyond that, no trail junction, no slim, dead young man. Uh, no hand grenade, no Kiowa, no morning fog, no star-shaped hole. It's all made up. But in another much more important way, the story is completely and utterly true, even though it's made up. As a soldier, more than 40 years ago, I participated in dozens, probably scores, of such ambushes. I stared at dozens, scores of corpses, 
And so this story is a way of collapsing all those ambushes and all those night patrols and all those dead people into a single short dramatic event, one in which I'd hope the reader could participate in some way. The taste of lemonade in the back of your throat, the chaos of not aiming as you throw that hand grenade, and the guilt, the lifelong guilt, staring at a dead human being, even though it's an enemy soldier. Despite the made-up qualities of this story, this invention, there was one particular late-night ambush upon which the story is based. And I want to recount it to you now without even looking at these notes, if I can. It was uh, midway through my tour in Vietnam. I'd been there, I don't know, four months, so not quite midway, but getting there. And about two in the morning, our company commander awakened all of us, or had his lieutenants awaken us. We were encamped on a hill. Uh, hill's the wrong word. Uh, uh, it wasn't a hill, it was a hump that we called a hill. There were very few hills where I was in the, in the flatlands. Uh, we were going out on an ambush. Almost always ambushes were done as small units. Uh, squad, a platoon, you know, maybe 12 guys, maybe 30 at most. But on this night we were going out on what he called you know, a whole company-sized ambush. Very rare. It's the only one I ever went out on. So we saddled up. It was a dead of night and we began walking through the Vietnam dark, which is dark like you don't know dark. It's dark without street lights and dark without flashlights and just, it's just dark. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, but, Appalachia used to be before, you know, the Rural Electric Association came in there. It's dark. On uh, top of that, we're all young American soldiers, stupid and very 18, 19, 20 years old, talking as we walk through the dark, canteens clanking, making noise. I mean, these operations never worked. I mean, we were just too loud and dumb. And plus, the enemy was never there when we came to try to find them. Um, in any case, uh, we showed up at this small, small, nameless village. I didn't know the name then, I still don't. About, I'd say four or five in the morning, somewhere in there. We encircled the village with about 100, 100 guys. Th at, the idea was that at daybreak, three of the platoons would move through the village. The fourth platoon on the outskirts of the village in a rice paddy. We were lined up along a paddy dike. The idea was just to gun the enemy down when they came out of the village. <clears throat> well, as I said, these things never worked, but for some reason, on this particular night, uh, it kind of did. Uh, I remember I was crouched on the outskirts of the village. I was one of the guys who was supposed to shoot down the enemy. And I can remember the, a little sliver of purple light over the horizon that was not uh, daybreak, it was sort of the light that precedes day, daybreak, that's just right, if you've gone camping, you know what I mean, there's a little kind of shadowy thing that happens on the horizon right before the sun makes its appearance. Um, in any case, that little, that, that, that mix of shadow and, and, and coming light was there. Went out of the village to my right, maybe as far away as the seventh row here or sixth row, pretty close. Three Viet Cong figures appeared moving right across our field of vision. Our paddy dike was going this way. So it was like being at a, at a carnival where you should see the ducks going by. You know, that only, only we were, didn't have pop guns. We had everything that technology can bring to an American soldier. Uh, firepower that in the hands of teenagers, you don't want to be around if that stuff starts going off. We all opened up, about, I'd say, 30 of us along this paddy dike, with everything we had, machine guns, M16s, we threw grenades, we blew claymores, we let it all rip at these three figures that were, as I say, maybe the sixth row from here, not far away. When the full, when full uh, light arrived, maybe, I don't know, how much later, 10 minutes later, a few guys went out into that paddy and found one dead Viet Cong soldier. How we missed the other two is almost incomprehensible. It'd be like, you know, miss, I mean, it'd be like having 25 howitzers lined up and like missing everybody in the room. It seems impossible. It goes to show what terror does to the human heart when you're in combat. You don't aim. That aiming stuff is for the movies and John Wayne, you just shoot. 
Uh, there are rare exceptions to that, but by and large, it's just close your eyes and let it rip. Ray, war is chaotic, and top of that, you are just terrified out of your mind. I remember, in fact, one soldier whispering to me right before it started. He said, make sure when you shoot, you shoot low, because everybody misses high. And I guess I didn't. Anyway, one dead soldier. Um, like the soldier in the story, he was wearing, uh, you know, just uh, black pajamas and had a pouch of rice and a, you know, and a little weapon, a couple of rounds of ammunition. That was it. Well, unlike in the story, I didn't stare at that body. I mean, I, by that point, I had seen enough bodies to last me the rest of my life. I didn't want to look at any more. But like that soldier in the story, I felt an overwhelming crush of, you could, you could see it in the way I teared up reading it. I mean, just a, you know, a few minutes ago, a, a crush of responsibility. I don't want to get self-pitying, but the word guilt is there for a reason in the human language. And if it's there for anything, it's there for that. You kill a human being. In this case, a 16-year-old kid. Okay, Viet Cong, but it's still a dead 16-year-old kid with a mom and a dad and a sister and a girlfriend and all the rest. It's a dead person, and not just the word enemy. Um, the reason, though, I wanted to tell you this story uh, is that I will never know whether a bullet from my weapon killed that kid beyond knowing. Bullets are too fast and the eye's too slow. Dark, it's chaotic. Thirty other guys are shooting machine guns. How am I to know if a bullet from my weapon killed that person or not? It is beyond knowing. It's beyond even the capabilities of science, unless someone invents a time machine to go back 40 years ago, and then a time machine that can also track a bullet on top of just going back. This is one great time machine that's got to be invented. It's just beyond knowing. Like much of the stuff in the rest of your lives, in all our lives, it's a lot of what we, uh, we go through in life, we just don't know the answers to, and this is one of them. Um, however, in a story, the one I just r read aloud to you, even though I don't know if my bullet killed that guy or not, I can take responsibility for his death in the story. I can stare in the story, as I've been now staring in my dreams and in my late nights for 40 years since. I can feel a, with you in your presence something that for throughout the war and for many, many, many years afterward I couldn't feel, which was emotion about it all. I couldn't cry. I couldn't get sad. Um, I could even barely remember, in some instances, as if I had erased uh, Auschwitz from my memory. It was just, much of it just gone. Um, I should take responsibility. After all, I was a soldier. I pulled the trigger. And to say I'm not responsible, what a, because I don't know, what a cop-out. And in a story, I can put a face on all that horror I witnessed over that uh, tour of 365 days, all those dead bodies. Beyond that, I wanted to conclude by saying that I hope the story, in a way, in my whole talk tonight, is a reminder to you that, that wars don't end when you sign a peace treaty. <laughs> they go on and on on and on until the last soldier is gone and the last widow and the last son of a soldier and the last daughter. Uh, they're going to go on in memory for all those people. I had a letter that uh, was blown away in Chicago by a nasty wind. I mentioned it over dinner tonight. That's an example of what I'm talking about, about how wars just ripple on. It was from a 26-year-old uh, woman who lives in my home state of Minnesota, uh, in Minneapolis, and she wrote, you know, wrote a, one of the most, I, I, I wish I had her words, I'm gonna have to paraphrase it. But she said, uh, my dad had been in the war, he never talked about it, I, I, I barely knew he was there, except for a few trinkets that I found, some medals and a, 
tattered old uniform folded up under a bed. She said our house was uh, a nightmare to grow up in because of his silence. It started him into drinking, um, it caused battles, nightly battles over the dinner table. She said at one point I felt more like a counselor than a daughter. And uh, she said at another point in the letter, she said at one stage my mom had come up to me and said, you know, I've never loved your father. And the girl said she asked, never? And she said, no, that something had happened in Vietnam that you couldn't love. It was not, like cells have receptors and, you know, and they didn't have the receptors for love. Then she said one day in AP English in high school, um, they were assigned the things they carried and she brought it home and they be all read it and they began talking about it objectively. That is, there's a book. It's not about me, the guy, or the mother, or the daughter. It's about the book. It's something separate that is outside you. And so speech is enabled and communication is enabled because it's not you, it's the book and the characters and so on. Well, she ended the letter by saying, and I've been meaning to write you for years and years now to say thanks. She said, We're, they're not perfect, but they're still together. And she thinks they're kind of happy because something started at that table talking about a piece of literature. Books can do that in human lives. We tend, to, when you're in college, to think of them as a kind of an obligation, a thing you have to have to educate yourself. And that, in some respects, I think is completely true. You should know books. But they can also do things to human beings that are unexpected and really quite wonderful. That's one of them. For that family, Vietnam didn't end when that treaty was signed in Paris. It went on and on over countless, you know, meatloaf dinners in Minnesota. And in some respects, it's probably still going on. Somewhere down in Orlando, Florida, right now, there's an old lady, about 94 years old. Her last name is Merricks. She's a black woman. And every night, around the same time, about three in the morning, she wakes up, jerks awake, and always says the same words, where's my baby? Where is my baby? And she goes back to sleep. Her baby was my friend Chip Merricks, a kid who stepped on a landmine and was blown into a tree in Vietnam and has been dead now for 42 years. The war is not over for Mrs. Merricks. With a peace treaty, they go on and on and on, even after the soldiers themselves are gone. Tonight, at various times, there are some certain faces I pick out in crowds, and a couple of you know who you are. I'm not going to look at you right now because it would make me feel weird, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who know war and have been in war. There has been the feeling that out in this audience on occasion, there are little there are ghosts sitting out there, like Chip is out there in row 12, and my company commander in row 2 with his stern look at me and telling me to get my shit together and just, you know, start being a better soldier. And Jane Fonda's out there, and Abby Hoffman, and Nixon, and Johnson. I feel like all these ghosts are, are around us, some of them still among the living, others long dead. That is the feeling of being a novelist feeling of conjuring up ghosts, not the real people, the real Tim O'Brien, the real Chip Merricks, but these ghosts which inhabit the books and which you hope can somehow, through being ghosts, these figures from, the, from history and also from imagination, take meaning and root meaning in your own lives, the lives of an audience and of readers. 
That is the end of my talk, and I'm told now that I should take about uh, some questions, right? So I don't know what I I don't know what I'd ask. <laughs> um, thank you. <coughs> thank you. 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 Um, I also am a veteran of Vietnam. You were one of the faces, yeah. I was there the same year you were. Um, now I forgot my question. Um, if, you, if you had it to do over again, uh, assuming that this is one of your true, more mm -hmm. truthful stories, yeah. uh, would you have gone to Canada in retrospect? The, I mean, it's, I, the answer is I don't know. It's one of the things that keeps jerks, jerks me awake at night. That. Uh, I don't know, but uh, there's, a th there's a thing in philosophy called situational ethics that has to do with the being rooted in the here and now, in the context, not just of rationality, the pros and the cons. Pro, you know, go to in lists of reasons and so on. But part of human decision making comes not from the, the brain, but it comes from the stomach and the tear ducts and the ears and the, the stomach tells me how could I my, how could I stomach it? It's that stomach feeling that's an expression that comes out of that that a novelist makes use of when we write. I'm not sure my stomach would permit it, even if my heart were to say leave and go to Canada. Uh, it's among those uncertainties that I was trying to write about and, and the things they carried, all the things that we do not know including things about ourselves. I do not know to this day if I'd be capable of going to Canada, whether I could face the hometown humiliation, the uh, old farmer sitting in a booth at the Gobbler Cafe in downtown Worthington saying to some other farmer, did you hear what the O'Brien kid did? The sissy went to Canada. And then to imagine my mom and dad overhearing that. Well, how does that, how does the calculus of decision making account for embarrassment and humiliation and the fear of it and the reality of it? I'm not sure that I'm capable of it. So the answer is, I don't know. I'd have to live my life over again. Yes? Um, I have a question. It has to do with going back to Cacciato. Mm -hmm. um, I came here because I read that book, but I'll be honest, when I heard you were coming here, I go, man, I really wanted to know, because prior to reading that book, mm -hmm. um, everything had been a certain viewpoint, and yours just came out of left field. I had preconceived <laughs> ideas reading it. Yeah. So the question is, I'll be honest, I had to read it three times. The first time was like way out there. The second time, kind of, so the point is, if I ever meet this guy, what the hell was he thinking about? Or like, you came from a, from a completely different viewpoint. Yeah. So. How did you, how did that like, materialize? The Going After Cacciato, for those who haven't read it, is, uh, is at least as good a book as Things He Carried. It. And I'm partly depressed by the way the Things He Carried has eclipsed it. That it really has. It, and it, it saddens me because in many ways it's, uh, I mean, at least the book's at least the equal. It's the story of a group of soldiers who one, one day one soldier says, enough of this, I'm out of here, and leaves. Said, I'm, wa I'm walking to Paris, goodbye. Can't be any more dangerous than Nam. You know, <laughs> might be dangerous, but it can't be worse than this. I've got a rifle to get rations, and, and you know, and I, you know, I'm walking anyway. Why don't you just straighten it out instead of going in circles? I'll just go straight and <laughs> head for Paris. And then the story is the story of a group of soldiers that go after him to bring him back to the war. You go get a deserter and bring him home for the war, bring him back to the war. The story came out of the real world it came out of sitting around foxholes at night and looking at the mountains with guys and saying in joking voices, what's to stop us? Let's just walk over those mountains and, well, that's dense jungle. It's going to be hard to find us. 
you know, and there's a thing called hiding, you know, where you can just sort of get under a tree and hide if a helicopter, because the Viet Cong have been doing to us now for a whole year, we can't find them, let's be, we horse around with thoughts like that all the time. It's part of anyone who's been in, the, in situations like that, there's a, there's a fantasy thing going on that, keep, that helps you get through it. Happened in Auschwitz and Dachau and happened in Nam, and it probably happens in Afghanistan. It can be on a minor level where the talk is about fantasizing about girls and cold Coke, a cola, when you want, when you're drinking patty water and you don't have any, there's nothing you want more than a cold Coke or a cold beer. Uh, that fantasy world that draws you out of the war, even though you're in the war. Uh, the second thing I want to say about that is most of the great Western books about war, the, the fiction about war, has that thread of running in it. Red Badge of Courage, Henry Fleming, fleeing from battle, trying to do better next time. Catch-22, Orr, the character of Orr, rowing for Sweden, you know, go through, intentionally, you know, dumps his plane and, you know, I'm going to leave the war. Yossarian himself wanting to run from war. Frederick Henry in a farewell to arms, rowing across the lake, you know, running from World War I. The Iliad, you know, scenes of flight just abound in the Iliad. I mean, I could go on for a long time. It's a, it's, and it's, 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 ex, it's explicable as a theme that if you're in the horror, you want out of the horror. And running is the instinct to get away from it. What stops you from running is this whole constellation of stuff, from everything from the sense of your own reputation uh, to a sense of duty. Uh, love of country, all kinds of you know high, elevated, idealistic uh, 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 forces, but a great many just petty forces. I don't want my buddy to think badly of me, and I don't want that old farmer in the gobbler cafe to say, "Did you hear what that sissy did? He, you know, he walked away to Paris." <laughs> and so it's good to that, that it's a. It's a fundamental uh, theme, not just in literature, but in, in, the, in the life of those who have been uh, pressed into warfare. Um, yes? Um, my question is kind of similar, but within the book, um, things they carry, obviously it's not linear, but most of the stories do weave together in some way. And then you have the, the sweetheart of the song for Bong with the mm -hmm. girl, the image, and the whole irony of what's she doing there. And I just thought that that was so out there. Like, yeah. how does, you know, when you, when you were writing this, I mean, well, lots of thoughts. I mean, it, it is in a way that we're talking about the sweetheart of the song to Bong story about the girl who shows up in Vietnam and what happens to her where she's seduced by combat. Um, I wanted a story that was about storytelling. There was a, throughout that story, the, the guy telling the story, his name is Rat Kiley, everybody's scoffing at him saying, this can't be true, it can't be true. A girl? How could a girl come to Vietnam? He said, what are you talking about? There are girls in Vietnam. There are nurses, there are secretaries working for contractors. There are, you know, uh, Quakers. There are journalists. Um, there's even a statue to them in Washington, by the way. That, that's not in the book, but there is on the mall. Not as well known as the wall, but it's there. Um, so I wanted, I wanted an internal commentary about why don't you believe, why don't we believe stories that contain elements of the extraordinary, the improbable? They aren't impossible because we know that there are women in Vietnam. Um, the second thing is, is that the story was grounded in, in two ways in, in reality. The first way is that when I first arrived in Nam, I was told the story. I was, I was told, you know, there was this guy who brought his girlfriend over from Cleveland Heights, and I didn't believe it. I said, impossible. And the guy said, why don't you believe it? You don't believe in airplanes? And I said, yeah. I, you don't believe you can buy a ticket and fly to, you know, like Bangkok if you're, you know, an 18-year-old high school girl? And I said, well, I, and then right away I began, I realized right away what he was, he was saying I didn't believe it for only one reason, and the reason was gender. There were 500,000 of us guys over there of the, of the same age, you know, many of them even made it through high school. She made it through high school. Well, I mean, I'd say half of my fellow guys, you know, they, they couldn't pass, you know, advanced edition. And she did, she made it. So it was gender, and I said, so, so that intrigued me. When I, and then I heard the story again, then I heard it again. 
And then I heard it when I got back to the States. After I'd written my first book, I gave a reading out in Seattle, and there was this line of people where you sign books, and a guy came through, and he said, oh, you were, you were in the Quang Nai province. Did you ever hear about, he said the real name. I'm not going to say it to you, but there's apparently a real name for this person, this girl. And so, I, 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 well, okay, I never saw her, so I, I can't validate it with my own eyeballs. But I've never seen Obama with my own eyeballs. <laughs> and I believe he exists. I mean, it's a rational, you know, I think he's out there in the real world. I didn't see him, but, you know, we take things on faith sometimes, and if you know, if you've seen enough. Anyway, beyond that, I wanted to write a story, even if it weren't rooted in fact. Let's say she didn't exist, which I'm pretty sure is not true. I'm pretty sure she did. But I wanted to write a story in which a woman was put in my boots. And what would happen if someone my age and with my dispositions, a Midwesterner with all the sort of standard Midwestern values found, in this case, herself in a war? Would what happened to me happen to her? And you investigate this stuff through fictions. That's what stories are for. Stories, fiction does not exist to represent the world we live in. It's meant to, only, it's meant to do that, plus it's also meant to represent what could have been, or should have been, or might still be. That's what stories are about. A good story is, is about a mixture of the world we live in and what hasn't been directly seen, but could, could happen or maybe should happen. So I wanted to see what would happen to a woman. And then the final reason, and the most telling reason I wrote that story was that a, a good friend of mine, uh, whose books you can read, um, her name is Lady, L-A-D-Y, Borton, and she's written, among other books, a, a book called After Sorrow. And she was in Vietnam, exactly when I was there, without the advantage of a hundred guys around her to keep her safe. She was there as a Quaker, you know, helping refugees, living in Quang Nai City by herself a place that a hundred of us armed to the teeth were like terrified to go. You know, you'd just die any billion kinds of ways they could kill you. And she was living there, uh, you know, a girl from Ohio, taking care of refugees. And uh, I wanted to write an homage that, to her. Uh, she wasn't seduced by war in the way that my character was, but she was seduced by Nam in the way my character was. In fact, to the point that she's still there, the way my character is there, at least last I heard. When I was there in 94, she was still there. She's now you know, doing the same kind of work. Um, uh, that for as many people who went through the Vietnam War, it's not just the bombs, bullet stuff, as I mentioned. There's a, there's a, 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 a ghosty feeling to it all, where you feel that you're part of this uh, um, cultural uh, event that was cataclysmic on the one hand and enlightening on the other, sort of both simultaneously. It was the horror of my life and it was the light of my life, which is an odd thing to say, but look at my career. I mean, I'm a writer and I've written about Vietnam, so you, you, can't, you can't deny the obvious. I don't mean that you should go to war to become writers, I don't mean that at all. But I mean that all of us as writers try to salvage something from the horrors we live through, whether, you know, with Woody Allen might be a bad marriage or a hundred bad marriages in his case, and it might be a father who was abusive, or it might be a divorce you went through, or it might be, a, you know, a, all kinds of things, where as, what choice do you have as a writer but to draw, dive into the, into the wreckage and, and try to bring up art, something beautiful that you can rescue from it. It might contain savagery and, you know, obscenity and all the bad stuff, but you try to make it nonetheless beautiful, uh, just as the human being uh, uh, himself and herself can be beautiful. Maybe one more question and then I'm my voice is going. Yes, sir, right in the middle. Uh, my favorite passage from this book is when you say, absolute occurrence is irrelevant. A thing may happen and be a total lie, and another thing may happen and be true, may not happen and be truer than the truth. Mm -hmm. and you've talked a lot about, about how things that don't occur can, can be the truth, but could you talk about the first part? Oh. This, I couldn't hear the very end of your question. Could you talk about how something that, that does happen can not be true? Yeah. It, 
it happened all the time. Say there's a fourth, there's a Fourth of July celebration, and a bunch of vets are out there celebrating with the nostalgia of their time in Vietnam. Well, I contend it's not true. That their time in Vietnam wasn't the happy, heroic thing that they're portraying now. I think that they're suffering from amnesia and erasure, the way our country does. Um, that you can look at an event, you know, a, 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 a band playing the Stars and Stripes and so on, with that sort of blood surging glory thing going on, you know. That's almost a celebration of, of, uh, of the American psyche and not a celebration of what actually occurred, the truth of things. Well, you take that example and you multiply it by like 10 trillion, and you get an example, you get kind of what, I'm, what, I, what I mean, that there can be, there can be truth that's, that's true in one such a cir a circumstance but not in another. Now this is not to deny, for those in you in this audience, I, I, that there was heroism in, it was in Vietnam, of course there was. Um, it's not to deny that for a second. It is to say that there was much more than just that. There was a lot of other stuff going on there as well. War for me in the end had an overwhelming stink of, of nastiness in all levels, beating up on civilians and peeing in wells and burning villages and, and racism of the most flagrant and you know, horrendous sort. Um, that, would, that would sort of send shivers up the spine of an old slave owner, that bad. Um, it was nasty on so many levels beyond the obvious levels of people dying and getting wounded. And it was nastiness in a daily, um, minute by minute, second by second, like, it was like being swimming through crankcase oil and, and that, that, that horror of every second. Um, punctuated now and then by little moments of light and beauty and heroism every now and then, which I try to pay homage to in my books as well. But the overwhelming feeling was that. And I'm not sure that, that, the, that the, 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 the celebratory uh, the rhetoric of, of our warriors, myself among them, you know, I'm one of them, is, ent is entirely the right thing to do without at least giving some uh, mention of, the, of, the, uh, of the, the other side of the coin, which is that horror. Okay, I'm done. I want to thank everybody and a rainy night for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.